Healthy Forum series for this fall, which my colleague Kelsey Spencer and I are chairing this semester. The HCC Forum Lecture Series is an opportunity for the doctoral students at HCC to hear from and speak with scholars whose work we find intellectually compelling, scholars who are shaping the field, instigating critical conversations, and with whom we are engaged in our coursework and our research. This lecture series creates the space and time for conversation within our department, while also aiming to engage the broader intellectual community in Boston and Cambridge. We would like to extend a special thanks to the Luke Scott Cathedral Fund for generously, so sorry, for generously sponsoring this talk and for encouraging such discussion through HCC. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Enrique Ramirez. Professor Ramirez is a writer, architectural historian, and critic in graphic design at the Yale School of Art. He holds a PhD in architectural history and theory from Princeton University and a Master of Environmental Design from the Yale School of Architecture. From many conversations with our HCC students here tonight, I understand that at both his alma mater, Professor Ramirez had a significant impact as, an, as both a friend and a mentor. Carving time out of his doctoral studies, for example, to spend long hours with undergraduates and students. The list of Professor Ramirez's publications is long. His writing covers design at all scales and across different media and has appeared in publications such as Prospectra, the Yale Architectural Journal, Harvard Design Magazine, the Journal of the History of Ideas, and EFLUX, to name a few. Professor Ramirez also serves as an advisory editor for Manifest, a journal of American urbanism and landscape, and is a member of the curatorial advisory community for Exhibit Columbus, as well as the Global Architectural History Teaching Co Collaborative. Currently, Professor Ramirez is working on a manuscript that considers how exchanges between architectural and aeronautical cultures in 18th and 19th century France constructed new, modernized ideas about air and the natural environment. But tonight, we have the great fortune to be exposed to another critical aspect of Professor Ramirez's life and work, music and sound. Some of you may be surprised to learn that Professor Ramirez has been a recording and touring bassist since his high school years in Houston. He is the bassist for the Sound Art Collective Fieldwork and has recorded music with a number of contemporary musicians. Recently, some of you might have had the opportunity to see him perform with the interdisciplinary artist Hope Commodity at the 2018 Venice Architectural Biennale, and I think we might see a clip from this tonight. To add to Professor Ramirez's diverse set of accomplishments, he earned a JD from the George Washington University Law School and previously worked in the entertainment industry. Tonight, Professor Ramirez's interest in design and sound and his commitment to the theory come together in a lecture titled, Maximum Volume Yields Maximum Results, History as Aural Performance. Professor Ramirez will explore sound and music as historical materials. Although he delves momentarily into the parallel and intersecting theory or histories of modern orality and visual culture, Professor Ramirez considers different aspects of music composition and performance, sampling, coding, recording, and live instrumentation as techniques for creating historical knowledge. To demonstrate, tonight's lecture will consider a work in progress, a musical composition whereby Joseph Albers Payne, thank you Roberta, and Annie Albert Textile become sonic landscapes. This project suspends issues of representation momentarily in favor of a slight, curious, and perhaps playful turn of phrase, conversion. In other words, this is a project about the historical, technological, and performative aspects of converting one work into another, and its implications for the practice of history. At MIT, where we are committed to the exploration and expansion of interdisciplinary methods and the application of these tools to rigorous historical scholarship, Professor Ramirez's project and his research more broadly promise to provide highly original insights and to stimulate lively discussion. And now, please join me in welcoming Professor Ramirez. Hello. 
that was a great introduction. <laughs> I feel like I can just sit down and just watch these slides and move on their own now because I, you kind of hit all the important points. Um, so the first time I came to MIT to present was back in 2008 for the Research in Progress Symposium. And there, I presented some work that I had done in one of my previous careers as a lawyer, basically on, on um, the implications of, uh, of uh, modern aerospace law for thinking about historical issues. Uh, and that was, and it's funny because now I'm back talking about another aspect of my life, which is playing music and playing with musicians, which is something that I've been doing for a long time, much longer than actually writing things about buildings and landscapes and cities and whatnot. So I want to keep this presentation short just to invite discussion. Um, and I want to thank the program in history, theory, and criticism of architecture and art here uh, for inviting me to participate in this fall's forum. I didn't realize that was the first, so I hope, uh, I'm not sure what kind of precedent I'm setting with this, uh, with this presentation, but I'm very, very excited to be here. So to Chelsea, Roxanne, Izzy, and uh, Ellie, and others who were involved in organizing this event, thank you so much. You honor me by having me here. And I also want to take this opportunity to say hello to those of you out there, colleagues, mentors, editors. I see familiar faces out there. So um, <coughs> just to let you know that I, too, am here because of you. Uh, so you are much more than an audience. You are my inspiration. So I come to you from the very far margins of the practice of architectural history, like really, really far. So um, I don't even teach in an architectural history program. I teach in an art school, and I teach history of graphic design. And so I'm, I'm, I'm from really, really far off field. And I come with a strange paper bearing a stranger title, Maximum Volume Yields Maximum Results, History of Aural Performance. You will note that in keeping with the rituals of our field, the title follows a predictable structure. There is a clause which serves as a way to entice the audience. Then there's a colon, dots placed on top of each other. Um, then, um, which is really a sneaky way to elongate and explicate the title. Right? And then there's the last part, the dependent clause. The part in which you're supposed to understand that it is related to the first part. So let's consider the first part of the title of this paper, Maximum Volume Yields Maximum Results. It's a phrase I borrowed from the liner notes to the albums by the experimental heavy metal band uh, and sound art collaborative Sun O. So you can see here one of their jewel cases. Um, and it says, Maximum Volume Yields Maximum Results Optimized for Blackened Sub Bass Systems. But you can also read it in their technical writers. Right, these are, this is basically what I should have brought when I came here, basically telling the people who are gonna do the AV what, the, what, what you know, my AV requirements are. So um, this is the document that tells the people who are gonna be doing the sound at a concert by Sun O what the technical requirements for the concert are. Um, so what's interesting to me about this image, it's like this very um, Hildersheimer-esque um, image. There's stacks of eight by 10 Ampeg base cabinets and four by 12 Marshall stacks that look like their own high-rise cities. And this is where I quote the writer, you can read it there. It says, sun focuses on low and sub bass tones with intention of a heavy physical presence within music beyond the typical concert listening experience. The point is the pure physical power of sound towards the audience, an absolute encounter with sonics. We love frequencies such as 80 hertz, 110 to 120 hertz, 180 to 220 hertz. As a bass player, those are really low frequencies. You will not hear those, you might feel those though. So we worship uh, resonance and feedback. Frequencies you can feel vibrating the environment, air, and your body. So I'm trying to move it closer over here. So I don't know if this is it for you, so. So anyway, let me move to this next. This is just a footage of them playing get a sense of what they're doing. They um, dress up in these Cistercian robes as they're playing. And it's really loud. 
And this is basically what their setup looks like. Again, it's like these like just stacks of amplifiers. Again, you know, I just keep kind of having them and remind me of what they look like. So there, and I just want to talk a little bit just about the performance of those consonants, right? Because I'm very taken by them. I've actually seen the band a couple times, and like I always go with my brother, and it's always like uh, you can you can feel your shirt just kind of rustling from all kind of like the dissonant frequencies that are just kind of like er enveloping you. So there are many ways of describing performance. I find Diana Taylor's study of the term performance useful, for example. For Taylor, performances are uh, vital acts of transfer, of transmitting social knowledge, memory, and a sense of identity through reiterated behavior. In her calculus, performance is not just the object and process of analysis and performance studies, but it's also, also the methodological lens through which scholars analyze events as performance. Furthermore, Taylor, identifies performance as a theoretical term as opposed to an object or practice. I could go on, but this is only to say that performance is a fraught term, one that bedevils, beguiles, and bewitches. Right. And so this is a picture of me from two summers ago. Uh, I'm playing with, um, this is in front of the, uh, the American Pavilion in Venice. I'm playing with the Sound Art Collective's uh, Post Commodity. So that's me in the cowboy hat, and I am playing a piece of glass that's broken with a wooden spoon with a contact mic that's attached to uh, the glass table. So you can hear it. It's pretty loud. So um, this is just some images, just some more images to the performance. You can kind of see the setup because it's very different from what I'm doing right now where I'm kind of like standing in front of you with a lectern. You know, for this performance, you know, I was actually in front of a bunch of um, pedals and knobs and wires and stuff. So different kind of engaging with the audience. And so the performance, and you can see, uh, it's the very first image that I show you, but the, the image, sorry, the performance ended with me basically picking up one of those speakers and pointing it at the audience, which is basically blasts kink noise at the audience. And what was really, really great is that Bjarke Engels was speaking next door, and like his at this band, American Pavilion, and, he was, and they were complaining about the sound, which was lovely. So, but it was amazing. Just some more, just some more, just a better sense of like what we were doing here. You can see some familiar uh, faces in that crowd. But I want to say that uh, this, my exposure to this idea of performing history was kind of instilled in various different, ep uh, diff various different episodes throughout my youth and my education. So um, I think specifically of two separate instances from my college days uh, during fall quarter of my sophomore year at Northwestern, I took a course in Homeric Greek. That was my language. Um, that was the language that I qualified in. Um, and in this class, um, the majority of the class was spent learning to recite the dactylic hexameters um, from the Iliad. So we were taught to perform them in a specific way uh, to pay attention to the different stresses and nuances and spondees. And I still remember some of these lines, by the way, and this is the first time I've done this in years, but for those of you who know this, you will know the first five lines of the Iliad. I forgot it, but anyway, it's been over 20 years since I've done that. But um, So we learned that written Homeric Greek was a kind of intervention, one whose sole purpose was to interject a kind of imaginative written structure into something that has been exclusively oral and performed. And in my own demented imagination, this is a long time ago, like I said, I suppose that any time that I mentioned or recited the words rosy-fingered dawn or swift-footed Achilles, I was taking part in something that had existed for a very long time. 
And that brings me to my second encounter with the performance of history. Um, uh, my college advisor was Ken Alder uh, again story in the science and I was his first advisee it was a long time ago like I said and the first class that I took with him was a class on literary representations of the history of science um, it was a really wild ride uh, we read Nathaniel uh, in addition to Shelley's Frankenstein we read Nathaniel Hawthorne's Rappaccini's daughter and the artist of the beautiful Bertolt Brecht's Galileo Hermann Broch's uh, the unknown quantity uh, Robert Musil's Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften. It was before the big two-volume version came out in English. Uh, so imagine yourself taking this class with Ken and opening into these disciplinary vistas, all mediated through what my English professor, Alfred Appel Jr., who was Vladimir Nabokov's assistant at Cornell way back in the day, called the boundaries of modernism. And at the end of this class, um, you know, I found out that my final paper was not actually a paper. I had to write a short story and recite it in front of the class. And I stayed up for a very, very long, t uh, for very, very many nights. Um, and, um, and then I came up with a story that was uh, comprised of two interweaving narratives from different eras. One, one was, was basically a, a story about the, the, um, the, Az the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl taking flight, and the other one was about the flight of a Curtis Pusher biplane in 1913 by Mexican insurgents in the state of Sonora, right? So I'm not seeing all my notes here. Uh, give me a little bit of a technical issue. There it is, got it. Oh, sorry. All right. So this paper is lost um, somewhere in my parents' house. Don't throw things away. So they kept all my college papers. So, um, and I'm also glad for because of because one of the details that I remember from the short story um, is that I broke it up into four sections: public acknowledgement, resolution, pursuance, and song. And these are, of course, uh, the um, the names of the four tracks to John Coltrane, the Love Supreme. I somehow just grafted those onto my short story, right? So. And that, that piece, that album, that piece of music, if you recall, it's really, really beguiling. Um, I thought about these, um, and it's not just because of Coltrane's urgent and fearless playing, but it's for those parts where the band actually starts singing a love supreme, a love supreme, a love supreme. There's like this incantation that's kind of layered over the music playing, right? So, um, and like I said, we had to read these short stories out loud in class, and there's nothing as terrifying you this right now is hearing your own voice venture out into the unknown realms. Nothing is as terrifying as being a true vox clamantis in deserto, like my friend St. Jerome would say, far outside his comfort zone. Um, so I think performance was in many ways encoded in my own study of history. Right? And then I just want to show this picture just because um, um, you know, in all my studies in graduate school, the one spread from Esprit Nouveau that I was just kind of captured, this could be my headstone, right? Because like on the left, you, had a hem you have a Hangley Page bomber next to a portrait of Eric Satie, you know, which, uh, which is, you know, two interests of mine. So I would be lying to you if I told you that being a musician had no role in this kind of understanding of history that I had cultivated. So in college, I was a session player in various bands, and um, I was um, I, I was in a band with a very young with a very young Andrew Bird, for example, who was a year below me in college, and I toured in his band briefly. Um, I had become rather confident in my interest in my instrument, and no doubt because as a high school student in Houston, I also played bass and toured with a punk band. Um, these are flyers that I designed when I was in eleventh grade for my band. So um, a little bit of archival work here. So um, it was a scary and amazing time. I wrote an article about it for Harvard Design Magazine, um, which uh, Jennifer Sigler was very, very kind to commission. Um, so we opened up for all these really interesting bands, these kind of artifacts you know, of the dying days of punk from like the mid-'80s, bands like the UK sub, JFA, Nice Strong Arm, Glass Eye. You know, you can see in the movie Slacker appeared in that film. Um, and we also opened up for the Flaming Lips, which back in 1988 was just this uh, weird psychedelic band from Oklahoma that would show um, uh, clips from Kubrick, Roeg, and Camel films in the back. 
So just some more artifacts from my youth, right? So this is a picture of Mike Watt playing with the Minutemen, wearing a shirt that I made, right? So and what's interesting about this is that he's playing the bass guitar with his teeth, and he's wearing this like bandage around his head because his car had exploded and he got scalding hot water all over his head. So just a little bit of more autobiographical stuff. Um, so this is me in high school, and this is me in high school, right? So this is Houston, Texas. Um, um, I, I, told, I told some of you, I, I, I am like a relic in this program. So uh, this is in my neighborhood. Brandon Clifford lived on my street, for example. So we also went to the same high school. So, um, so if you are at the GSC in November, you will see Susie Barra um, lecturing there. So we played in a band together. We toured in a band together back in high school. So I was, it was this kind of weird, I just, it was this weird confluence of people that I was fortunate to, um, um, to play with. Um, Gary Hyde, the guitarist, is now a literary agent. Far more accomplished than me. So back to college. So here's my world, my daily existence, consisting of taking classes in history of science with Betty Jo Peter Dobbs. Uh, Ken Alder and David Jarofsky. Um, I took English seminars with Alfred Appel Jr., who taught us the best that the best way to read, to learn Joyce and Nabokov was to read it out loud, as if announcing them to the world. I took modern and contemporary art surveys with Michael Lagia, literature seminars with Reginald Gibbons, Elizabeth Dippel, Christopher Herbert. Um, I took um, very, very influential colloquium on the social and intellectual history of modern Britain with P.W. Hicks. I sat in a seminar with Bill Cronin. I even took a survey on modern drama with Charles White, Charles White and his father. It was a long time ago. And at night, I would go play in bands. I would go to downtown Chicago, Milwaukee, or even Rockford, Illinois, to play bass in an eight-piece band whose claim to fame was their jazz covers of Black Sabbath's Electric Funeral. Um, another professor of mine, um, Helmut Mueller Sievers, who wrote this beautiful book on the history of the cylinder, would always promote our band in his classes for us. And he was, he became a great friend of mine during college. So um, being a work student, a work study student by day and musician by night allowed me to pay rent and afford college. I didn't sleep when I was in college. Um, so I remember one ridiculously early morning in February 1992 when my friend Gabby um, came to me and she said, you have to read Romola by George Eliot, which is the George Eliot novel that I use. Um, I'd been up for 36 hours straight and was staring at my bloodless hands uh, that were covered with blood blisters from eight straight nights of playing. These are but a few, of few episodes from my heady youth. So it also you know, sounds weird and, uh, uh, and random, but it's not weird and random because it's, for me, that's, it's something that's been a great interest, not just as a bass player musician, but as a person who's trying to find new ways to exist in the world at large as an architectural historian. That's, that's what I do. I think that's my career. That's in my career. It's like I'm trying to figure out how to do what you do, but not in the classroom and not in the university. Right? So I'm still a recording artist, and I'm s still asked to be a session bassist for albums. And so... Like I said, I come to you as an architectural historian tonight, but one that just happens to be a musician. So this is some of the materials that I work with these days in addition to my typewriters, right? You have a fretted Fender Precision Bass, a fretless music named Stingray Bass, and you have an, a reverb oscillator pe uh, uh, pedal that's named after the, um, after the uh, Paris, uh, uh, one of the Paris transit lines for the metro area. So, and just a little bit just to delve a little bit more into my own work, into um, playing music and kind of finding new ways to understand environments through, uh, through music. Um, uh, when I was living in Indianapolis, I was working very closely with Stuart Hyatt, a sound artist, a national, who is now a National Geographic, like a true National Geographic explorer, who would take sound samples and ask musicians to play along with them. So, one of the things that I was asked to do was to play bass tracks to a sound of a volcanic eruption in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and that's what I'm about to play for you, right? So what I was asked, the cue that I was given was, was basically like be a motoric 
band, you know, from Germany, like in the mid 70s, and like play, pretending you're playing in the Caldera, right? Try to be like the beat of the, try to be the rhythm and the beat of the volcano. So what you're going to hear, right? is gonna be the sound of the volcanic eruption, the sound of one of the field uh, guides that was recorded by my friend Stuart, and then you'll hear me playing music. And I'm playing two bass lines here, and I'll point them out, so. two bass parts. One is like a kind of like a pulsing part and then there's a cluster meter that I'm playing in the upper octave of the instrument as well. So basically covering the full range of the instrument in my recording. So just a little bit more just about the way music, you can think of music as kind of like uh, as a way we interact with certain topics. So um, this really brings up the projects that I'm involved in at the moment. Um, which involves two methodological issues. And the first considers the portfolio of artifacts of art and architectural historians consult for their own work. Moth-eaten texts, dusty archives, and other ephemera uh, residing in the cobweb ribbons of our minds. These are the constituent elements from which we construct our histories. The question therefore arises, how does sound figure into this equation? What kind of historical material is sound? And there are uh, approaches to this question, which is kind of troubling. And so, oops. Uh, yeah, sorry, skip a little, sorry. Um, so there are approaches to this question that are, for a lack of a better term, ordinary. So we may have recordings of lecture and symposia, for example, or there may even be radio programs or even the audio tracks to television programs and documentaries about art and architecture. And these are useful, no doubt, but they are recordings. They are representations of events. And we rely on these sound circuits that correspond to written words that we associate with the speakers and in turn use to know something about the past. And there are some ways to talk about sound as a kind of historical artifact. I want to uh, point, this, point out this album to you by the artist Bengo. It's called 2050s. Each different track is played on a different synthesizer and the tracks are arranged chronologically. So it's a really normative understanding of the way we construct the past. And Each of the tracks is named after the different synthesizer that was used to make the music. So I have one here. It's really loud. There's like one of the speakers is tapping a little bit. So if you 
basically if you swipe up to all of these, it's, you basically go to this kind of like war of synthesized sounds. Some, some, some sounds that are very abstract, of course, to things that sound of an organ. And then there are other <coughs> other things that I've encountered as well. For example, one of my favorite one of my favorite visual um, uh, one of my favorite visual materials is the score to Krzysztof Penderecki Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima for 52 Stringed Instruments. Right, so it's a piece of music that's com uh, that's composed in tonal clusters, right, and then uh, and then the clusters are kind of projected on the page, and what's what I really love about this piece of music is the way that the different kind of dynamics actually are, are, are enacted very expressively as well. So this is a much more lively piece than the uh, than the original song. So other ways in which uh, we can think about the of sound as a material uh, for thinking about history. I'm thinking, of course, uh, many of you will know Reg, but I'm just going to bring up the sound. Um, the disintegration loop by the sound artist William Bezinski. So uh, I think some of us are familiar with, the, with that project, but it's a really, it's a really beautiful project. And what, it, what happened was that uh, William Bezinski, who collected audio tapes, was basically in the process of converting them from, uh, from uh, tape to digital uh, when 9-11 happened. And so as he was recording, or it was right before, so uh, as he was recording them, he captured the sound of the tape heads breaking up uh, the, actual, the actual plastic and the chromium di dioxide on the tapes. So the sounds that you hear on the recording is actually the decomposition of the sound, right? And basically, uh, after, it was, uh, after it was, the project was completed, it was played on the days after 9-11 as a kind of like commemoration. Really beautiful piece of music. It's really a way of thinking about history. It's almost like a, a, a modern contemporary version of Samuel Barber's Adagio. And the sound, these are sounds that are decomposing as we listen to them. And as you keep on listening, it keeps getting more distorted and broken up as well. raises the second methodological question, um, which is what kind of historical knowledge is sound? And this is much more of a qualitative question as well. It asks us to evaluate and justify why sound should be used as a historical material. Can we know something about the history of a building from the sound inside it, for example? How do we recreate the noise of a building that does not exist anymore? And what about silence? What role does it play in our historical knowledge? And this is a project about methods and the output that such methods can produce. And at first blush, it has something to do with this basic idea. And this is the original prompt, right? I had a conversation with Adrian Kapelkinen uh, months ago who uh, asked me to participate in the Bauhaus Centennial Symposium at Yale. And she said, well, I don't want you to present a paper. I want you to do something you know, atypical. And what do you want to do? And I said, well, I kind of want to do something with music. She said, what do you want to do? Well, I, I don't know, maybe I'll convert something from an image to sound. So it was literally that knee jerk about it. And I did go in that direction. Um, so, and it really kind of like posits this, 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 this you know, it, it's a question. I mean, it's just a pure question. I mean, it's just pure imagination. It's like, what if sound was part of the war story? What if it was part of the history of Jerusalem? 
so um, we can work on this here. We can work on that. So, excuse me one second. So, I'm going to rely on my phone to finish this. So, um, So back to this idea of like, you know, what if Dan was a, you know, part of the first year of the Vogue course? And it's kind of like a, it seems like a pretty dumb question, or it's a pretty, or at least an obvious question. So after all, Bauhausers were exposed to a wide range of techniques, um, and given the kinds of materials and processes available today, it would not be surprising to have sound as part of a first year course in a design school, I mean, one would hope. Um, but it's not. And I'm guessing there are many reasons for this, and one of them has to do with the actual medium of transmission. For the, met for the methods and techniques of teaching architecture and the visual arts are tried and true, but there's no reason why this is the case, why we can't have sound. So the association of making sounds in the production of images is indeed rich. Take, for instance, uh, Ernst uh, Chladny's uh, dis uh, discoveries in the theory of sound from 1787. Right, which, which features drawings of sound wave patterns appearing on various plates. So he was using these to measure the speed of sound waves propagating through gases. And, or to take an example from a more recent history, um, consider Yevgeny Merzin's ANC, ANS synthesizer uh, developed in 1938. Uh, the musical instrument takes its name from the initials to Alexander Scriabin, uh, known for his compositions that showed his interest in synesthesia. And if synesthesia is something of a neural converter, a process that does more than convert colors into sounds, right, then Merzen's ANS synthesizer can be considered as one of the original inspirations for this project. Right? The machine performed a reverse operation of sorts. When plates covered with a black rubberized solution, which you see here, one etches lines and shapes. And those near the top correspond to higher pitches. At the bottom, they become lower notes. And once the plate is inserted into the actual synthesizer, um, a line is shown into the plate, so it goes to the etch lines and creates these various sounds. Insert the plate at a higher speed, something approximating a fast tempo is achieved. Lower speeds equal uh, lower tempos. And here's a, a sound of an ANS. Uh, I don't have actual, I don't have good footage of the actual device, but this is what the device sounds like. And uh, if you've seen Solaris by Andrei Tarkovsky, it's an instrument that's used for a lot of the sonic textures in the movie. Uh, and uh, it's used by Eduard Artemyev, uh, the Russian composer. So going back to this, right, this idea of conversion, it's a reverse, I want to talk about a reverse operation that I'm interested in, because when it comes to this idea of using media to create art, the subject of representation will invariably arise. An artist represents an idea 
to the world via painting, sculpture, building, landscape. I wonder if the term representation may not be working hard enough to depict the processes that we have to make of these things. So if something is represented, it entails only an asymmetrical relationship. The artist creates and the audience reacts. And here's where I want to rely on a vestige from common law, namely the wrongful act of conversion. It was one of the rigid torts that was taught in, common, in, in law school. And although the history of this term is quite long, as is the case law that interprets it, for the purposes of this project, conversion is essentially the intentional changing of state so that the result has either added or decreased its value. For example, if you go to your neighbor's yard and cut down their tree and put, them, put it in your car and then take it to a mill and sell the planks to others, you have converted property. Wrongfully, I may add, for you did it without the other's consent or knowledge. What I find interesting about conversion is not the legal claim, it's been over 20 years since I practiced law, but the action. Right? That's to say, the knowing conversion of one thing from one state to another. And that's really the wide-angled explanation for this project. We want to convert images to sound. One of the um, one of the kind of like guiding clips or kind of things that I was really, really thinking about uh, in this project of converting paintings into sound, I was thinking really hard about this scene, and you're going to recognize it. I'm not even going to talk about it. Okay. That is a commercial, so <laughs> so anyway. It's a clip from a, a Close Encounters of the Third Kind where Francois Truffaut basically uh, introduces the, the, the system by, by the Hungarian composer Zoltán Kobayi for basically converting sound to hand signals, right? And there's a really, really famous scene where, uh, where he's actually sitting in front of a tape recorder uh, play, basically mimicking a tone, the, the, the five notes of the scale, uh, into these hand gestures, right? And it's used as a pedagogical tool and then, uh, again, as we, as we think of, of the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, there's the scene where uh, the actual communication takes place between uh, the extraterrestrials and the, you know, the, the scientists. It takes place via music. Right? But what's interesting, though, is that the sounds that you hear, and I'm not going to play the clip because I can hear there's going to be some kind of ad that's going to play, it's interesting, if you listen to it, it's actually, they're using real instrumentation, right? You hear a tuba, like the spacecraft is sounding like a tuba, and the keyboard player, is, it sounds like an oboe or a clarinet, right? And there are other kinds of conversion that I'm interest in, interested in as well. So for example, this painting. which is, uh, of course, the painting by Fontaine and Latour, which, of course, becomes the cover to New Order's Power, Corruption, and Lies, right? And you see the kind of polychromic bar on the end that was a kind of like uh, this, this like color-coded system that was used uh, throughout the album uh, to basically spell out the names of the band, right? And their titles to the songs, and you're supposed to decode it using the center spoke of the album, right? It becomes kind of like the skeleton key for the record, right? And then here's the other side. Right? And then here's a painting, which is basically an enlarged, it's based on an enlarged JPEG of the actual painting. It's kind of like different, uh, different levels of appropriation and conversion that we're using into music. So let me talk to you about my collaborator, right? So this project that I'm going to be doing, which is actually go, we're going to we're going to perform it at Yale on November second, if you want to go, uh, and I'll show you the schematics, the performance schematics for it. Uh, my collaborator is this person here, uh, a guy named Greg Harrington, and let me just show you what he does because he converts architectural paintings into music. So this is one of his famous.
seeing there is basically he's uh, using uh, VXP Max and uh, in, th in this other program called Touch Designer, which I'm learning how to use, and there's this incredible learning curve, and I feel like I'm back in school because of it. Basically, taking, uh, creating an algorithm that reads an architectural plan and conveys it in a new sense, but basically using a keyboard, he's able to alter the pitch as the images, as, as the actual software is scanning the plan, right? So, and he does that for different churches that he's attending. So, we're gonna be doing that with Lutheran as well, as well as other churches as well. But these are some of the things that we've been trying out. So, let me just uh, just talk a little bit about uh, how we're doing this. Um, so just about the kind of the, the, the technology. So um, uh, in essence, what we're doing is, like I said, is that we're, we're converting paintings into sound using computers and live instrumentation, right? So we are basically using our combined sounds to alter the images in two speeds. The way that we're doing it is that uh, he is uh, manipulating sounds and images, and I'm playing with them. And I also have contact mics all over my body that's amplifying my sound, my body sounds, as I'm playing the instrument, and it's being woven into the material. So it's something as, as this is like this, I'm, I'm actually becoming a part of the piece, right? So some of these are some of the visualizations that we've been working on uh, uh, using uh, Max MSP and Touch Designer. And this is just me, uh, this is just me playing on a keyboard. Uh, kind of training the software basically to, um, to vary the, the hue and the thickness of the line according to the sensitivity of the key, for example. I'm not a pianist, right? And then we also tried it uh, where I was basically trying to alter Lisa's curves while they were being played on the piano. And then you can hear the difference. Basically, in coming up with sketches with different kinds of visualiz uh, visualizations, we want to do kind of create our own kind of interface that we can like show the crowd. And this is basically a, a footage of like us using contact mics as like a crowd mixer tool to basically record the sounds made as they're rever reverberating against a piece of metal, right? So, uh, and again, this is for example one. This is uh, using Ableton. It's very blurry, but this is basically. Uh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna sound like this. body being hooked up to a computer and here it's being played and I'm not going to be able to do it so uh, as I'm playing it I'm just going to kind of like really kind of it's not going to like hook up to the computer but I can do it while I'm playing it so how are we creating music so basically we are <coughs> We haven't, we haven't decided which Albers paintings to use yet as a test set because what we're going to do is we're going to go into an archival workshop that's going to be held the day before and actually make some music and we're going to actually make some music using that those archival images, right? So what we're doing is we're taking, for example, an Albers painting and basically constructing ratios out of them and converting these into intervals on a chord, right, or on a scale, which I can do on a fingerboard and can be done on a keyboard as well. So as you can see here, this is just basically just a piano schematic for an Albers piano, right? This is not one particular thing that you're going to see. Uh, we're finding out ratio, we're finding out <coughs> ratios and proportions, and we're trying to use these as a way to calculate intervals, right? And this is basically just here's, for example, one. You can see how it's scanning. Uh, you can see here that it's, it's scanning the image. 
think of it. And the idea is that as I'm playing against it, it's going to alter the image that you see on the left. Right? So it's basically two impulses. It's almost like I'm playing with an Aldo painting. So, right, so we're going to be performing this in Hastings Hall on November 2nd, right? And this is just basically our technical writer, which kind of shows where we're located. And you can see the arrows, um, a lot of the arrows, which shows uh, um, where am I in this image. So, right, we're on Hastings Hall. So, right, you can actually kind of see, like, the arrows contacting, basically connected to the computer as well, right? Um, so, and then you can see where the, you know, the setup is, like, the prototype, like, the technical Hastings Hall, which you can kind of see the actual row pretty well. And basically, you're putting two semi, uh, you know, you're putting a, <coughs> you're basically wrapping the painting with two strings, but we're going to use short throw projection to show our alteration. Right? And so you can see. So the idea is we're not only altering the sounds and altering the images, but we're going to be projecting them as well. So, like I said, we haven't actually chosen which of the paintings we're going to use. We're still developing the various schema, right? And like, um, we're also trying to figure out actually how to work with a three-dimensional object like a crayon, right? It's like, wh how can you use, how can you use, um, how can sound, for example, capture all the kind of like, you know, all the different kind of nuances and so forth and try to, um, you know, we're on a really like a hunt for, for kind of like that kind of thing in the world. So I think 